Hello one and all, and welcome to After the Checkered Flag, my F1 special series here on the Behind the Glass podcast, where I am joined by Paul Wallace. Am I a co-host yet? No. Am I I still a guest? (laughs) VIP guest, Paul Wallace is here. Resident guest. (laughs) Resident guest, never seems to leave. To reflect and review the latest Grand Prix as part of this, this insane Formula One season. I love the track. Or, or, or Formula One as a gen, as a whole. <laughs> I was going to say, I love the Austrian Grand Prix yeah. for mainly for the memories I have of it from the late 90s, early noughties, when okay. it was the A1 ring. Yeah. We had Hakkinen and Coulthard and Schumacher, and it was just, there was always action. It was just fun, and it's a beautiful setting. Mm. And I think every year I'm like, yeah, Austria. <laughs> and there have been some great races in recent years since they've returned to the A1 ring, or now the Red Bull ring. But in general, actually, when we think about it, they're never that exciting. They are mm. quite processional. I always feel like, as well, the activities around the race on Sunday, normally that Red Bull create themselves. You know, we had the caravan racing with Danny Rick and Verstappen. They did the drifting. This year, they were up in a plane, and then they took those weird Austrian-looking European trucks around racing. That content, in a way, was actually more exciting and a little bit more enjoyable than the actual race itself. So that's why I think there's always hype around the Austrian Grand Prix because we get that build-up of Red Bull dropping a YouTube video that we all want to watch because it's like Sonoda freaking out at this (laughs) play. The Red Bull behind-the-scenes content with Sonoda was amazing. (laughs) Yes, we are into the second part of our triple header I don't even know what you call it, sort of, I don't know, we have the French Grand Prix and now we have two at the Red Bull Ring. One of the more intense parts of the season, shall we say. There we go, nice way to summarise that. Um, That's why I'm here. (laughs) After a surprisingly exciting French Grand Prix, (laughs) I think we all went to Austria for the first of these two Austrian races, going, oh, this is, you know, what a beautiful circuit. We've seen a bit of drama there over the years. Rain is in the forecast. I was just about to say. Hello, like there was a lot building up to it that we thought this is going to be great. And unfortunately... It was one of those races, which look, they happen Mm. every now and again. As a fan of motorsport, but also Formula One, you've got to accept every now and then it's going to be a nil-nil draw. You know, it's going to happen. It was actually one nil to Verstappen. It was one nil to Verstappen. (laughs) Good point. But there just wasn't a lot of action. Um, We did see some stuff down the sort of low end of the midfield, which we will get into, of course, because if you never listened to one of these podcasts before, um, essentially we go through the finishing order in reverse. So from last to first, kind of talking about each racing driver's race and their weekend and any thoughts. So we skipped through some people who were relatively, <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, more often than not, it's the same people that we talk about each week. We should try and change that up. Let's, you know what, because Do not it. a lot happened. <laughs> An episode about- dedicated to Alonso. <laughs> Because <laughs> we never talk or, about or Alfa Romeo. Romeo. Or Alfa Romeo. Or Alfa Romeo. We honestly, never talk about Alfa Romeo. Think, I don't think I'd have anything to say. <laughs> well, I'm going to press you to do that. So, okay. um, <laughs> yes, we're going to try our best to somehow get a full episode out of, <laughs> unfortunately, what was a pretty dull uh, race at the Red Bull Ring. Uh, but it, it had its talking points. And you mentioned this qualifying was kind of where it was mm. at. It was a very exciting session. Uh, sort of lots of things that we can analyze, which then I guess led to the race that we ended up having. You know, if qualifying was slightly different, as with every Grand Prix, we would have seen a different race. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it sort of, you know, it hinted towards the form of the cars. And I think sort of strangely a bit like Barcelona maybe, because of the sort of layout of that Red Bull ring, it doesn't allow for, I don't know, it's sort of, the pace of the car, that's all you've got. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it, how fast your car is, is that it? You can't be that imaginative. You can't seem to ever eat It's, it's too not that much. strategic. No, exactly. It's not that strategic. There's not huge opportunities to gain huge amounts of performance over and above what your car can or, do. Or pull out like a secret card that you maybe like kept back. Yeah. I think everyone can see your hand and it's a case of either reacting or doing some... Every, yeah, it was a little bit like... And five days after the French Grand Prix, there wasn't going to be huge amounts of development on the cards either. So Which anyway. Which well, I'm a little bit worried about this weekend coming. <laughs> We've got another race at the same track <laughs> with the same cards. Anyway, let's get into it because we've been babbling along for enough now. We've got to get into our race results. And let's kick things off, actually, with something we can talk about, which is Pierre Gasly. Mm. I mean, not even completing, what, one lap? Yeah, it was a bit of a shame. Real shame, because we've spoken about it quite a lot this year. Gasly is on form. He Mm. is really smashing it. I think him and Norris at the moment are really 
shining in car or well, outperforming their cars yeah. I would say um, and the last of few races Gasly has really impressed and another great qualifying P6 wasn't mm-hmm. it I think um, and then to have that sort of kind of mediocre contact with Leclerc at the What's start what? it was weird it was a very odd sort of thing it was like they sort of forgot Leclerc forgot where his front wing was and yeah I, you know, I just, just think he completely lost the concept of how big his car was because yeah. he just kept like nudging him yeah. and then nudging him again yeah. and Gasly was like oh I'm trying the best I can please <laughs> like, leave me alone just pushing him along the road when actually all it's gonna do Leclerc was unlucky but also it could have been a lot worse and in the end Gasly was the one that was ret- re- he retired and Leclerc ended up having quite a fun afternoon oh Leclerc <laughs> You know, you know, I'm always happy to talk about Charles, and there was a lot to talk about with Charles. But yeah, for Gasly, I was, I was sad. I think there was potential for him there to score solid points. If you look at the starting order and then the finishing positions, you know, those who sort of started high up did sort of really have the chance to finish uh, high up. So um, I think he could have bagged some more points for himself and Alvatari. So sad to see, um, and equally sad to see the next person on the finishing order, George Russell. Yeah. Oh, gutting because I'm going to say it, Williams starting to look not completely useless. You know what I mean? Do you know know what the the biggest moment for me was in qualifying when Latifi put the car onto like P8 and then every single team had kind of brought the cars back in. They were like, we're safe. We're good. We don't need to go again. And then Latifi goes like half a second quicker than Russell. It was eight tenths faster than Russell. It was And then it basically sent the entire paddock into a flap to get the cars back out. We are not safe. Latifi's just gone up. He's put (laughs) it on pole. (laughs) That's the thing, right? It wasn't like, wow, what a lap by Latifi. It was like, (laughs) oh, if Latifi's P8, we gotta get out. Because he will end up last. Which Um, he almost, he did get knocked out. He did get knocked out, yeah. He almost, I feel like that lap, he was a trailblazer in the sense that he literally set the circuit on fire. Fire. he must have raised the temperature of the tarmac with that lap because then all of a sudden all of the drivers came back out and the track just was so much faster but that's the thing do you not think it was just signifying or hinting that that was the case like like bless latifi no, I, no, no i'm no, sure no. he's I'm now latifi's biggest fan <laughs> <laughs> you're the latifi and stroll fan crew yeah. over there all by yourself uh, got, he's got money hasn't he <laughs> just love canadians <laughs> yeah. but i think basically like I think that's all it was, you know, whilst he might have driven a great lap and he has been getting closer to Russell this year, Latifi, we have to applaud that. At the same time, it was just hinting at all the teams, oh, wow, there's a lot of, of track development here or track mm. progress. We've we got to get back out there. Um, but but in Russell's hands, that Williams is now no longer a surefire bait for the back row because of Haas, um, but also it has a chance of, you know, being able to get close to the point maybe even Q3. I mean, there was there was a glimmer of hope yeah. at a Q3 appearance there for George Russell. 0.008? Literally, 0. yeah, 0. 8, 8 thousandths of a yeah, second. Yeah. Did end up starting P10 because of various penalties and things like that and lap times being deleted. But a mighty mm. impressive. And in the race, we saw him keep that pace. I mean, I think at one point he was P7 and then he was riding in P8 pretty solidly. I think at one point, Everyone was saying, oh, there's a train behind Russell. Oh, no, wait, the train is behind Alonso, and Russell is, Russell. Ga- is gaining on Alonso. <laughs> he looked really so, racy at one yeah, point. He was yeah. going through some, I think, turn three or something like that, looking like he was really about to take on Alonso, which would have been epic to see. <laughs> they and the car in party mode. <laughs> they turned up the Mercedes engine too full. <laughs> Did you see, by the way, though, there was a very awkward feature with Alonso and Russell yes. at the sky pad. Yes. Oh, it was totally. Yeah, but have you seen Alonso and Mazepin swap helmets? No. <laughs> so that happened. And I thought that swapping helmets was like the ultimate sign of respect. <laughs> to buy into your whole sort of merchandise. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's it called? Um, uh, theory. <laughs> and Alonso's just come back just to nick everyone's helmets. Yeah. His museum. Yeah, yeah, his museum course. in Spain has got all these helmets. It's like the big, it's got oh. this massive wall of like 50 helmets. So I think he's just gone back. He's and gone, come we need, back. We need more helmets for the museum. Yeah, because yeah. this is the last year of hybrid cars. Everything, everything's changing next year. That's Who, what it is. He, he just wants that memorabilia. Memorabilia for the museum, more ticket sales for the museum. Think he thinks that he's looking ahead for 25 years time where he's going to go bankrupt and then realise he needs to sell all of his memorabilia Maybe. and then start off a Formula One memorabilia page. Signed by George Russell. You know what's quite encouraging is we never get too much slack for going in on Alonso so much, which means we must have a very small Spanish demographic. <laughs> um, but we shouldn't go quite so hard. But, um, but, but yeah, I think... There was this awful moment on Sky F1 where they decided to do a Skypad lap by lap comparison with Russell and Alonso. 
off the back of them swapping helmets in Monaco, I think they kind of thought, oh, there's some mutual admiration there, and it's Alonso, and it's Russell, and yeah, let's go. And it was just really painful, and Alonso came across like this kind of slightly sort of a semi-comedic old man, like, oh, you know, you, don't, you break there? Oh, wow, like, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> and then George was like, kind of not sure what he should be saying or giving away too much. So he was all a bit cagey. And then Ant Davidson was like, come on, guys, you can tell us. And they were like, no, we're good. In comparison to when Rosberg got Norris and Gasly to stand next to each other after Paul Ricard and basically said, now fight. <laughs> Rosberg, he's just like, he's actually becoming an amazing TV yeah. pundit. He just goes in there, just, you see him with Toto yeah. and Horner. And he's just like, oh yeah, so uh, Christian, <laughs> Mercedes came after you and your flexi wings. Why don't you go after Mercedes for their flexi wings? Yeah. So he's like, mate, we paid you like 30 <laughs> mil a year for five years. Calm down. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, interesting to see. But I think Russell, he, he is doing well on that Williams, but I think that Williams is starting to look more competitive and it may be some future tracks. We don't have too many more races at these sort of sort of short circuits you know looking at the calendar ahead but we've got another race at Red Bull <laughs> Ring next weekend and he does have a chance to An steal some points yeah. exactly so good to see for him um, we then come on to old Nikita Mazepin uh, who I think had quite a quiet weekend there mm. wasn't much to say no no big Mazepin spins no big dramatic moments no. just kind there of was that moment where they were kind of going head to head in turn three which is technically turn two and then into turn five not four down the hill, right? Yeah, where Schumacher came in and then locked up. He locked up. Oh, Mazepin locked up. There was a I moment where... This moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this was probably when you went out and got your second vaccine because you realised the race was so boring. <laughs> Didn't want to talk about it. Have I yes. just thrown you under the bus there? I got double jammed yesterday. <laughs> Midway <laughs> through the race. <laughs> yeah, basically the Haas cars nearly came together. So they decided as part of a strategy of some sort to make sure that they don't crash into each other and cause un some unnecessary bills. She, they brought Schumacher in. Oh, but okay. Schumacher came in, I think he got quite close to Mazepin, and then they came down to the end of the DRS zone. Yeah. And um, I think Mazepin locked up. Okay. And there was a little bit of another moment where it just looks like those cars are fairly undrivable, especially for rookies. Yeah, for sure. So, so I think if he's not crashing, he's doing well, Mazepin. Yeah. So, so fair play to him. And I think... Schumacher luckily had a, well, not luckily, I don't know why I say luckily, but had a stronger weekend after mm. maybe a couple of hiccups in the last few races. Uh, managed to finish in 16th, so actually Latifi was wedged between the two Hasses. And, uh, you know, again, a actually there was an interview with Gunter Steiner where he just said, what can we, like, that's it, what can we do? We've got, we haven't developed the car since last year, there's no performance, it is what it is. I think it was Martin Brundle that asked Gunter whether... He's counting down the days till the next season. He's like, I'm counting down the hours. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, God, it must be painful. It must but be, yeah. There's something in there which I think, you know, get a crazy Turkish Grand Prix because Turkey's back, people. It is. Super exciting. But get a, a very rain-soaked mad race. I think there's a potential for a Schumacher or even a Mazepin, mm. you know, P10. Yeah. Uh, you never know, and I'm sure that's all if they're hanging on for. Crash. But <laughs> if everyone else fails to finish um, so anyway yeah good to see um, moving on here's one of your mates Alfa Romeo Giovinazzi oh yeah yeah he was P15 uh, P14 yeah, but did, did he got into Q2 or did he get into Q3 Giovinazzi yeah no. yeah yeah Stereo. maybe not Q, maybe not Q3 but he was he was in Q2 and I think you're wrong there mate no I remember seeing him bat around like what the hell <laughs> Uh, hold on, see if you full results. Oh, why are the cookies on bloody Formula1.com? <laughs> Piss off cookies. Okay, uh, so qualifying results. 20, oh my God, there's so many ads. It's quite, yeah, it's quite hard to do this on the fly. Wow. Giovinazzi, 15th. Okay. So that's Q2. So, uh, he Danny, uh, where's Kimmy was Q1, so yeah. There was a moment where I saw the Alfa Romeo go around and it just felt odd to see him in and amongst all of the other cars that were there. But I mean, that was Q2, so <laughs> shows how well they're doing. <laughs> anyway, P15, yeah. well done him. Um, <laughs> Esteban Ocon, quiet uh, old weekend. Uh, Signed that contract and just went, well, that's it. That's yeah, yeah, but that's what I said last week, yeah, didn't I? Don't need to turn yeah. up. Yeah. He's, he's got it in the bag. Um, and I suppose if they did want to replace him, they'd probably have to pay him a lot of money. I don't think they're going to replace him, but I just think no, but he's like, just had a... If, if in 18 months' time and they, they want to they want him to exit his contract they're gonna to have to pay him a lot of money yeah i i just think we were all surprised that he got that three-year contract weren't we mm. but but a couple of quiet races and alonso seems to be slightly 
yeah. outpacing him at the moment. So we don't really know what that's about, but not great for, for Ocon and, and the rest of his season at the moment, if that's going to continue. I just think he should do leg day once in a while. With <laughs> his legs are scarily thin. He's a very tall, thin man. I know. It's it's not a Formula One driver physique that no, you usually see. It's but not, but I suppose if he was to spend more time in the gym, then he would probably just go outwards, very muscular, become incredibly heavy and then not fit in the car. You'd know about these things way more than I would. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, P13, Danny Rick. Mm, he had a difficult weekend. I think unlucky, if I'm honest, because, yeah. yes, okay, qualifying, second off the pace, I think, from Norris. Yeah. So, yeah, n- not great in qualifying. Uh, we've spoken about the thought that it's all around the braking of this McLaren, slowing down the, the car, having to change his driving style, he can't quite get his head around it. That would have been uh, extra di- expedited. Uh, would have been made more obvious at a track like Austria, mm. which is, you know, high speed, big braking, etc. Yeah. But he did well off the line. He was up to P7 at one point, yeah. something like that. You know, he Similar d- to Paul Ricard. Exactly. Done very, very well at the start, looking competitive. And then unfortunately had a few mechanical issues. Power. Power unit issues. Loss of power. Loss of powers, which, yeah, unfortunately put him out of the points and made him super uncompetitive. Did, w- did we see any data to back that up? McLaren or- did back it up, though. McLaren did back it up to say that there was that, that there was unreliability that it wasn't there. It wasn't purely his lack of speed. Right. Um, whether once he dropped down, he was a bit like because sometimes drivers go loss of power, loss of power, and they're like, nope, no, <laughs> no loss of power, mate. <laughs> yeah. Accelerated pedals, the one on the right. <laughs> um, no, I, I, th- I think okay. I think we did. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ride him. I think just just a tricky. Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely yeah. not saying that he's completely lost his talent and he should go back to Australia. He's not lost his talent, but he's just not got his he's handle on that yeah. car, has he? Mm. He's definitely struggling. Sebastian Vettel, unfortunately, a bit of a quiet race for him as well, P12. Very, very quiet. Yeah, we really didn't see that much of Aston Martin in general. Well, your boy Stroll well, hit P8. Well, yeah. Well, That's I mean, not bad, is it? No, he's done well, as he always does. He's just a, such a he's just such a relaxed driver, and there was a period where you'd see him in interviews, and it was like I don't want to be here, and I think now he's slowly starting to feel comfortable in his own skin. He feels like he deserves to be there a little bit more, and you I know what we're doing. I'm just going to stop you right there. Doing exactly what we said we wouldn't do, which is talk about the same drivers and make the same points as we oh, always do. Okay, so we yeah. talk about Bottas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to keep powering through because Kimi okay. Raikkonen had a, had a relatively competitive yeah. weekend, actually. P11, just outside the point. But he was there or thereabouts. And I think, you know, Kimi, we've got to say, does continue to impress considering he's now 85 years old yeah. in a relative competitive Alfa Romero. He's always there or thereabouts. Mm. When he gets a track that suits him, what he seems to enjoy, he seems to attract some, some performance out yeah. of that Alfa. So good on him. Um, Yuki Tsunoda, P10. Uh, what happened to what, him in what, qualifying? Love to know what note that was, if there's any musicians out there. Uh, <laughs> so P8 in quali. So he went backwards, did he? I no, no, because he got a penalty. So I think he starts in P11. Uh, okay, P11 fine. or P12, because that bumped George Russell up. Right, he but was yes, one of the he ones. Did, he, did, he did qualify high. And I feel like at some points, I felt like I saw him higher than... Yeah, I mean, I, it's not a race I remember seeing or hearing a lot about Sonoda. No, which is weird because he was the only Alpha Tower ra- Alpha Towery running. Exactly when Gasly had that unfortunate failure at the start. I'm just, um, I'm just going to get up a graphic that I sent you because I want to see how far Sonoda's race Sonoda got up the grid. Finished tenth. Okay, so he got up to ninth. I think he jumped up to eighth, maybe based on. Pit, yeah, a fairly, you know, monotonous race. Yeah, nothing, nothing huge to talk about with Sonoda apart from his amazing pre-race antics in the Red Bull, <laughs> Red Bull promotional <laughs> content. I just um, find that so outrageous, but also it's very Red Bull. You know, like professional athletes, elite mm-hmm. athletes in their contract, for example, professional footballers aren't allowed to play recreational football mm-hmm. in case of injury. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it amazing that they are able to take up these ropey old toasters with wings, shove four out of the 20 Formula One drivers in that one plane, and then go around the Alps. <laughs> I mean, that You're like, a, that's a disaster a waiting disaster to happen. A disaster waiting yeah. to happen. I remember doing a, a military open day, and they were doing Chinook or Chinook rides. Yeah, ch- Chinook. And, think, yeah. and basically, Chinook. Chinook. Um, two parents weren't allowed to go in the same helicopter. 
And this was an open. Oh. I was sat there in the briefing going, oh, what is going on? Like, are these destined to have a crash? Yeah, so when they crash, we can't have two pairs <laughs> yeah, in there. Yeah, so That's so intense. I find it unbelievable that Red Bull are able to create opp- opportunities like that where something so terrifying could potentially happen. And then it wasn't like the pilot was backing out of anything. I'm pretty sure at one point he turned the entire engine off. And then you saw Sonoda's face just go white. <laughs> Sonoda was not having a good time on that flight. Um, but but good good to see his personality because it, it feels like that's been kind of, you know, pushed down a little bit recently, being like, focus on your racing. And we yeah. sort of lost the the hilarity that um, that he showed in some of his preseason yeah. stuff. Um, Alonso, good old Alonso, Jimmy Alfonso, P9. I mm-hmm. think competitive weekend for him. Yeah. He was there or thereabouts. He was looking I think he had a fun weekend. I think he's probably looking forward to this weekend coming, getting in another helmet and uh, (laughs) adding it to the museum collection. (laughs) Um, I'm now going to rattle through the top eight because we do have an interesting stat or data part that we want to talk about. Mm. And that just wasn't, I mean, actually, no, there was a little bit to talk about. So Stroll and P8, I think the most impressive part of actually the top eight was the Ferraris. And I'm not saying that because I'm biased. Yeah. But Sainz and Leclerc had solid, solid race pace and Mm. both of them scoring solid points for Ferrari in their sort of battle against McLaren. Mm. Um, you know, Leclerc especially like charging through the field at various times. He said himself, best race of the season, he thought. Yeah, he thought that it was the best race of the season because of the overtakes. And I remember seeing his tweet where he was saying it was bittersweet because obviously we got knocked back. We had to pit very early, which then obviously changed our strategy. But then it was really fun to do all of the overtakes and end up where I ended up. But at the same time, um, if you hadn't have had that, issue at the beginning you wouldn't have done all of those overtakes I think in his head he was tweeting that to be like well if I hadn't have been knocked back I just would have done all of the overtakes and ended up on P1 <laughs> like and I was like no nah, yeah. yeah it's not going to work like that like yeah your race pace was good against all of the cars that you ended up being behind question is though did he do that on purpose to make his weekend more fun no, no, no. <laughs> you always like to come out with these sort of very sceptical uh, reviews. <laughs> Did he outperform the car? Were, were Ferrari genuinely the third fastest car that weekend, but just badly placed in qualifying and therefore ended up, as I say, the third best team behind Norris? Or did Leclerc add to the performance of that car, pull off some key overtakes? Should he have actually been P9 or P10, but he managed to get P7? I think that's how he felt. Yeah. I think he felt he added performance. He pulled off some moves that he had to make, and that's what got him so close to his teammate and in P7. Mm. Um, let's wait and see. I think fundamentally what we did see is Ferrari had killer race pace. Mm. And if they had a bit more pace in qualifying, they would have easily been yeah. fifth and sixth instead of sixth and seventh. Yeah. Um, but that damn cheeky Lando Norris <laughs> getting in there at the circle we know he loves. P3 in qualifying yeah. after Bottas's penalty. Great, great result. And then P5, another. But he was just so quick in all of the sessions. There was purple sectors flying out the back of that car. That McLaren does like that track, unfortunately not in Danny Rick's hands, but yeah. uh, Lando just, yeah, absolutely on top of it. Again, such solid results. Has he had a top six? No, he's scored in the points every single race. He's the only driver, he's the only drive, the points. Only driver to finish in the points every single race this season. So such far. consistency, which I think is great to see. Great for the team, great for him. Um, well, it wasn't that long ago where Alonso was in McLaren's with Van Dorm, and you just watched it, and it was so... Sad, yeah, of course. To see. And all I wanted to see McLaren being such a top manufacturer and a uh, competitor in Formula One, you just wanted to see them back up there. So now I feel like I should say that because they are up there, exactly. Um, and hey, who knows what's going to happen in the next few years, but they're looking more and more competitive each season. So who knows? Maybe mm. we're going to have Norris and Ricardo if Danny can get on top of that car fighting for wins next season. Who right. knows? It would be exciting. Po- podiums if both of them can get on podiums more. I mean, that's only going to be a good thing. That's what we need to see, right? Um, And then we get into the top four. Perez, Bottas, Hamilton, Verstappen. Now, apart from some sort of, well, I wouldn't even necessarily call it strategic clever. Perez's stop was just slow, wasn't it? And then... Yeah, it was... Yeah, his first stop was slow. His first stop was slow, and that's what Bottas, that's where Bottas got the jump, and yeah. then that was that was kind of it. I don't know if this hinted at the fact that maybe overtaking was a little bit difficult for the top teams at the Red Bull ring. Mm. We saw some overtaking lower down in the field. And traditionally it's a track that does allow overtaking, but <clears throat> it was surprising considering Verstappen's performance dominance or, or how much faster he was than Hamilton and Bottas that Perez couldn't really make an impact mm. on Bottas once Bottas has gone ahead. Yeah. So that did surprise me. It did close him down, but I kind of thought that was a sure fire. He was definitely going to get past him. 
um, especially on the fresh tires towards the end of the race. Yeah. So um, good for Bottas, I guess. You know, he needed that result. He's had some pretty oh, I think dodgy. He, I think going into on Sunday morning, if someone said you're going to get P3, he would have taken that. Considering the last few weeks that he's had the, the few races, then obviously even going into qualifying, it was almost a case of damage limitation, just purely because of the penalty that he got. I've seen quite a lot on social media. I'll be really interested to see the comments underneath this podcast, whether people thought that his grid penalty was harsh or not for his pit lane spin. I don't. I, I, so that if you missed it, well, I can't believe you would have, but obviously <laughs> in practice... Bottas doing what pretty much every single driver does, every single team does, which is do a sort of, a, basically a burnout, sort of mm. tyre warm up away from the pit box uh, during practice. And for whatever reason, lost control. I think he was trying to do a quicker getaway and he and he was in second gear. Right, okay. So. And obviously with the wheels spinning up, there's more power, more torque going through the rear wheels. and He, he lost control. Yeah. I, I do think it was one of the more dangerous things we've seen because we know how people move around the pit lane during practice sessions. We know that McLaren were actually out mm. uh, holding back wheel guns and things like that. I'm not Fundamentally, w once he started spinning, he'd lost control. The yeah. Where his car ended up and how it ended up wasn't too bad. No damage, the car wasn't stuck, he didn't hit anyone, but it could have been it worse. And I think worse. that's where the penalty was. It was like, it was, I think that's what they called it, you know, the potential danger. Yeah. Um, and so, it's kind of more of like a guys don't be idiots in the pit mm. lane. Like, you know, if this happens again or it's so, yeah, no, I don't think it was hard. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I it, yeah. I, it, no, I just saw it on social media. I don't really know where I stand, but I was yeah. going to go on to the race director's reaction with, of Verstappen's, uh, a, 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 burnout at the burn, celebration, burnout was, celebration, yeah. which I thought was bloody cool. Cause it's like, ah, do you know what? Like, they're so far behind me. I'm just going to slow down and lay down some 11s. But when have we seen celebrate? Like, yeah. do you remember back in the day when the cars used to weave all over yeah, the place? Yeah, yeah. Like, we just haven't seen it in so long. So I agree. It was nice to see a bit of personality and yeah. a bit of excitement yeah. and like someone and doing something. And then the something. race director's just like, slap his wrist. Don't do that again. Never again. Yeah. You'll get, oh, which I think is, I understand maybe after the Bottas thing and the fact that Latifi was literally right there coming yeah. past him. But And it was also Latifi that had that crash. Have you seen the video? No, of, I think it was like three, three and a half years ago where a race driver did exactly the same thing and Latifi was still battling for track position. Oh, and plowed into him. And literally went through the back of it. <gasps> okay, mm. well, that'll probably be why. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think we've got to be careful with Formula One sometimes. I'm, like safety, of course, so important. And yeah. Got to take, but at the same time, don't, chase safety so much that we lose any kind of character or personality or entertainment yeah. or, or what the sport is. The one thing that I saw that really upset me at the weekend was the hint that they were going to try and slow down pit stops yes. and maybe even go to an IndyCar style mm. of less yeah. team members. You're then making Formula One not what it is or what it's supposed yeah. to be, which is the pinnacle of any sport and showing the true ability of individuals and, yeah. and mechanics and all these different things. You know, a Formula One pit stop, the fact that it can change four wheels and sometimes some other elements in less than two seconds is one of the most incredible things that anyone will ever see. And if, mm. nowadays, when there's not a lot of noise, it's a spectacle. And if you're lucky enough to have grid lane, um, uh, sorry, start straight uh, grandstands or paddock club where you're overlooking the pit lane and you can see that happening in real time, it's unbelievable. Mm. And to suddenly take that away in the sort of name of safety, I, touch wood, or not touch wood, but I don't remember the last time a mechanic was seriously injured. Don't say that. In, in, no, no, but I, I seriously, I can't because- Kimi Raikkonen, Bahrain. When was that? What was that? No, but, he, but he, that was a, what, a sprained ankle? No, I'm pretty sure he snapped his entire leg. Okay, he broke his leg. Okay, <laughs> bad. It's pretty but, gruesome. But, oh, but it does happen, of it, course. Fun jack men and like, the things happen. But, but it's freak. It, it's, it's freak yeah. and you're in a dangerous sport, blah, blah, blah. And I just think, you know, hey- The, the more you go over to try and cover yourself for any sort of freak accidents, the more boring it's going to become yeah. and the more monotonous. And, and also I love pit stops because there is an element of, because, Jeopardy. They, because they're trying to do it so fast, there's a potential for a mistake. And then all of a sudden you're looking at a pit stop at like 3.2 seconds going, oh, that's a little bit slow. And when the driver behind is eight tenths behind, you're looking at them on track, seeing whether they're getting the hammer down to try and get past them. And there's an element to it that I feel like, like you say, if they take that away, Where's the excitement? 
and watch Indy 500 and look at how many accents there are in the pit lane there. Mm. I mean, it's not a model to copy or to follow, I have to say. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's the thing is, you know, you, you get anyone who's not into the sport to watch and see a pit stop happen and they're like, Wow, that's yeah. insane! And if you lose that, I think it's it's. I mean, taken do you remember? It, it probably wasn't even ten years ago where they were refueling the cars, and I mean, the potential for a car to catch fire or the amount of time. Well, that happened loads, didn't it? Something went yeah. wrong with that. It just feels like if we're going down that route, which I'm sure we are, um, then what is going to be the next ten years? Yeah, no, I think you always have to err on the side of caution there uh, in terms of you know how how aggressive you go in this in the name of safety um and fundamentally you know it is priority but you've got to keep the spectacle somehow and, and i do think we love f1 but and so do the drivers because of how dangerous it is that's exactly it well because how dangerous but also because of for me it's the best of the best i want formula one to always remain the ultimate version of motorsport to show yeah. the creativity of an aerodynamicist the ability of a driver 300 people working together to make the ultimate performance the mechanics like I mean, how insanely skilled do you have to be to be a tire changing yeah. guy yeah, these yeah, days? Yeah, like, yeah. And so why not allow that? Why not allow everyone to be the best of the best? Yeah. They were um, talking about how the Red Bull pit crews have changed shape over the years. Like it was five years ago, maybe people that were slightly overweight or they weren't necessarily athletes whereas now they train so hard if you look at them through the race weekend the amount of exercise that they're doing the amount of group workouts that they do to be in the best shape physically and mentally to be able to do their job as best as possible like that in itself is an investment into a particular part of a race even though it is only two seconds yeah, and a race it's team vital and as we've seen, you know, with Perez or with other races, yeah. if something goes wrong at that pit stop, yeah, that yeah, does it completely could screw the change. the entire race. Exactly that. So um, anyway. FIA, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up front, Hamilton and Verstappen. Um, I think Max is on a great, great, um, what's it called? He's flying. Great stride. No, great. great uh, um, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, he's just. Rhythm, he's great just, rhythm. He's great soaring. Roll, great roll. Like, the, he's just, the Red Bull has given him wings. Oh, hello. Oh. <laughs> um, he's got the confidence. Yeah, the car's yeah, performing yeah. well. Well, as I say, because we're, we're in this sort of three back-to-back -back races now, I would be very surprised if suddenly one of the other teams mm. had changed the sort of rate of performance. Red Bull have clearly got this advantage in qualifying and in race pace, and Mercedes kind of have to sit there and live with it for the next few mm. races before they can introduce any you kind of... You saw how comfortable he was as well in the post-race interview, where he was just like, ah, oh, do you know what? I think it was Mark Webber that inter interviewed him, and he was kind of saying, do you know what? it was so nice to be able to manage my tyres throughout the race because it meant that I still had the grip at the end of the race. So there was never a, an element Well, he's learning, of, right? Yeah. Different different way of racing for him where he's usually probably been the chaser or yeah. like struggling with time management. Like so that. he was almost and able to manage the pace. Um, and Lewis just unfortunately didn't have an answer for him. Yeah. And apart from the late pit stop for going for that fastest lap, everyone was lapped up to Lando Norris and P5. Mm, and then mad. Bottas and Perez were nearly 50 seconds off mm. the pace. So, you know, it was a dominant performance by Max. I think we will likely see the same again at the, this weekend's yeah, race. I wouldn't yeah. see why that would be any different. And for him, it's going to set him up really great. I think there's a chance we could be going into the summer break with a with a 30 plus point mm. lead for Verstappen in the championship, which is, yeah. which is makes the second half of the year very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is worth saying because obviously there is a lot of Lewis Hamilton fans as we are. There are also a lot of Max Verstappen fans and a lot of non Lewis Hamilton fans. And I know that we've talked about it in previous episodes, how maybe there are some chinks to his armor. Lewis or Lewis. Yeah. I felt like, Obviously, in the last race at Paul Ricard, there was that moment during qualifying where I, for the first time, was like, he hasn't, he hasn't got the pace to, to beat Max. In this weekend, I thought he flapped in that second round in Q3 where he needed to pull a lap out of the bag. Did you see him zoom past him? Yeah, yeah, of course. Try, and he, what, I just didn't feel like he was starting that lap as fully prepared as he could be because he was flapping for track position. Well, as we saw, he was three tenths off in the first sector. So that, yeah. that lap was never coming together, so was it? So that was the first almost mistake that I felt. Either Mercedes did in sort of bringing him out when he did or him just not being right on the track position in qualifying. And then also that mistake where he almost, where he did put that left rear tyre in the gravel, had a massive moment of oversteer, lost about seven tenths, six or seven tenths in that lap just by itself. They were the two moments where I was like, if Max did that 
and Lewis was P1, you'd just be like, oh, well, I mean, it's just because Lewis is Lewis. But it's the opposite. It's now a role reversal and watching that as a as a Lewis fan, but also as a, I'm not a, I'm not a non-Max fan. Like I am also a Max fan. And if he won the world championship, it would be so cool to see. Um, but it was that moment of realisation that Lewis is on the back foot. Maybe he's not necessarily in the fastest car, but him trying to push and trying to get that car as close to Max Verstappen is causing a few imperfections in what has been a very, very perfect career so far. We spoke about it a few episodes ago. You know, I, I've definitely spotted it personally for the last three or four races. Um, well, even since the start of the season, Imola was for me the first mm. sign that I think, you know, it, it's been such a long time. You know, I, I have literally obsessively followed Hamilton's career since, since 2006, really, the, the GP2 year. Um, and you had all these sort of, you know, the, the first couple where he was such an exciting new fresh talent, should have won 2007 championship, did just about win 2008. Then we had the sort of slightly dodgy years in between that. And then obviously the Mercedes years. And I think definitely being someone like Tony, for example, who is a self-admitted glory supporter and has come to for the Formula One relatively late. And the only Formula One he knows is Hamilton being don dominant. Yeah. And Hamilton has been perfect, at least for the last three years, not put a foot wrong. But go back to even the Rosberg years, you know, the, the, every single driver cannot be perfect, as perfect as Lewis has been, but that's because realistically he hasn't been challenged. Mm -hmm. He's been able to go out there and absolutely be at one with that car and extract every single inch of performance because of the confidence in himself and the confidence that he knows P1. Yeah. Like, you know, in, unless I really screw this up, and sometimes he has, like we've seen over the last few years, times where he'll miss an apex or lock up a wheel and he'll still get pole yeah. because he hasn't had that threat. Now, Mercedes most definitely are not the fastest car on the grid. He has, at the start of the year, pulled out some great results and we've seen him sort of outperform Verstappen and maybe outperform the car. But at the moment, he's struggling. Mm. There are a few tents behind. He hasn't got the pace. He's getting frustrated. He is making a few mistakes here and there because we're seeing him having to really chase the pace. And yeah. for me, that is great and it will lead to some epic races because this is the Hamilton that I've been missing as a fan. Yeah. The Hamilton I always supported from day Bit one. Grip the between oh the teeth my God. just to win. Yeah. Was that was the you know the Verstappen that we see these days? And I think a lot of people support Verstappen because of the start the style of his driving. Yeah. But some of those Hamilton races, like Turkey last year, when he can really battle through and pull out amazing performances. And in France, we saw a little bit of it, the way he extracted so much performance from the tires. But what we're now seeing is this Hamilton who's so He's got in all this experience of winning these championships. He's a little bit Alain Prost of like playing the long game. Mm. It is what it is. We're not the <laughs> fastest team. He's got this kind of, I think, this belief or this confidence that it will all come right at some point because he's seen that over the years so many times that he's like, I've just got to get the maximum. And that's what he's doing. He's P2, isn't he? Yeah. If, it, if he's not winning, he's P2. Yeah. And that's all he can do until hopefully the team, you know, find a little bit more performance or give him that chance or he sees that opportunity. Um, I think what we're seeing with Max, and people went in on me a little bit last week when I was saying he looked a bit flustered when he went off the track of the first corner. It wasn't just that moment, you know, people were saying that I was too critical, but there are still moments with Max where I do think he gets a little bit over zealous or over whatever it might be but also we're seeing this new max this year which is this calm mature very low-key max which we've never seen mm. before and i think we're just seeing the most epic of battles and it's going to go on all season long and i truth heart on hearts i couldn't say who's going to win this championship at the moment yeah i you uh, know i don't know which way it's going to sway i think but. three or four races in i think you would back Lewis and I don't think you can ever write him off because he knows how to win a world championship and it, and this race season is incredibly long but the more the races go through and the more laps that happen and also the more laps that Max leads it's kind of like oh do you know what he is in the best headspace and in a great world championship winning potential car and but I think those two combined uh, he's very confident going into every single race weekend that he can deliver a pole lap and they can go on and win the race. The question will be for both of them, if Verstappen has a little bit of unreliability or a couple of unlucky races or Mercedes gain a bit of pace, how does Verstappen's head handle mm, it? Because he's never been yeah, in that position yeah, before yeah, in Formula One. Yeah. You know, leading the championship, you know, as you say, being in a dominant car at this point, if that suddenly turns or he has some bad luck or some accidents or whatever, not his fault, 
How does he handle that mentality? And same with Lewis. You know, I'm not saying that Lewis would handle that great, but his experience would allow him to handle that better. But at the same time, it's been a long time since Lewis has really been on the back foot. And 2016 against Rosberg was arguably the last time, but still he was in the fastest car and it was really unreliability that held him back. So we haven't seen Lewis in a proper head-to-head dogfight really since 2007, 2008, or you could argue maybe 2012 when they were all super competitive with Mm. Jensen and things like that. So we've got a lot to learn about both these drivers as the season goes on. I think that's what's so intriguing and so exciting. But talking about teammate battles and battles throughout the season, you sent me a really interesting stat, which basically broke down the percentage of teams' points by each driver. So Mm. basically who was kind of scoring the most points for each team. And I thought it was an interesting stat, actually, because it's not always as one-sided as you might think. Yeah. Um, so just to kick things off, um, let's start with with Red Bull, Verstappen and Perez. I would say only sixty one percent Verstappen in yeah, terms of yeah. the you know it, it's. I would have thought he'd scored seventy five percent of the team's yeah, yeah. points. We'll flip it that flip it the other way and introduce it as Perez has scored forty percent of Red Bull's points. You think that's quite a large chunk of points? Yeah, that's that's pretty decent. You know, considering that he did have a slower start to the season, I mm. think he's really performed well the last few races, and he's now bringing himself in contention, in contention, <laughs> <laughs> in contention for that championship. You know, he's yeah. a strong P three now. I think ninety six or ninety odd points, so only thirty or forty behind Lewis. Yeah. Um, you know, it's impressive, and as I say, yeah, not not as strong as sort of sway as you would have thought. And the same with Mercedes. To be fair. 65% of the points have been scored, scored by Hamilton. Makes a bit more sense. But again, I well, actually, no, I wasn't I wasn't going to say 70% because Bottas did have a strong start to the year. Yeah. He just had a couple of races off the boil. But, and um, then, obviously, Lewis was out of the points in Baku. Yeah, fair play. Um, so, McLaren, I think more obvious, 72% of the points have been scored by Norris. Mm. I think Danny Rick really will be killing himself over that. Yeah. Ferrari, I think, is the sort of the the surprise one in the sense where it's 54% Leclerc, but what an evenly matched pair mm. they turned out to be. At the beginning of the season, you would have never have said that. And I definitely would have, because no. I remember when signs signed for Ferrari, you're like, oh, I've said this before in the podcast. I just didn't see him as a Ferrari. I know. You it didn't. just was weird. But he's doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> he is, is slotted into that car and almost molded into that car. And he's just, yeah. He's, Ferrari must be loving him. Yeah. Loving yeah. him. Um, Gasly scored 80% of the points for Alfa Tauri. I think mm. we saw that coming. Uh, Vettel, 68% of the points. Obviously, yeah, that's really a- Baku that gave him that huge and Monaco. chunk of points. Uh, where did he finish in Monaco? Fifth. P5? Yeah. P4, P5. He had a strong race. He's driver of the day. Yeah, P4, P5. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so no, but I mean... I wouldn't have expected it to be that much of an advantage, but I guess that we're going lower down in terms of the point scoring or the number of points scored. So yeah. it does skew it quite heavily. Um, but yeah, strong from Vettel, which is so why it's surprising he had such a quiet race at the mm. Steering Grand Prix. Let's see if he can do better this coming weekend. Uh, Alpine, 61% of the points have been scored by Alonso, but still they haven't scored well, Alpine. Only 19 points for Alonso and 12 points for Ocon. They are... Nearly lost, what, the uh, ninth out of the... How many teams are in F1 these days? 10 or 11? 10? I'm going to... 10. Must be 10. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah. <laughs> so they're 8. There's 20 drivers, so oh, no, it's fairly eight. basic. They're not, uh, where are they? They're seventh. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, seventh because yeah. Haas and Williams have got zero points each. So. Exactly that. That's what I was missing. Uh, Alfa Romeo, <laughs> 50%, one point for Ragan and one point for Giovinazzi. And then, yes, Williams and Haas, no points either. But uh, what's Latifi's highest finishing order this year? Do we know? No idea. 2021s. I mean, most of the races, I don't know whether he started, uh, whether he's finished the race or <laughs> whether he retired halfway through. Because it wasn't it last I'm his year. Fan. I'm his biggest fan. Uh, best race result, on, 15th. From now on, I will always track where Latifi does. I will be the roaming Latifi reporter every weekend. Good on you. <laughs> and Stroll. You'll be the only one. <laughs> yeah, but you're saying I've got to, we've got to talk about different drivers. We do, actually. So we should nominate. I'll have two, two uh, invi- okay, so you're, invisible drivers. Okay, so you're Latifi and Stroll commentator. I'm... Well, we do talk about Schumacher quite a lot. Don't no, we? you cannot have Schumacher. You need, yeah. you need like, Giovinazzi. No, no, I'll go Raikkonen and... <laughs> Alonso. No, no, <laughs> Raikkonen and Ocon. Okay. Right, can I know, okay, we'll talk about oh, They're our snore, new favourites. Snore. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so unfortunately, a painful race, as Paul hinted at, I went and got my second dose of COVID vaccine yesterday. So I, mean, I, feel, a bit, I feel a bit ropey today, actually, I have to say. It's a great positive. Yeah. I'm super, might allow me 
into the British Grand Prix. Who knows? Because now we know tickets will be available. I actually have no plans to go. But hey, <laughs> now, now that I've been double jabbed, maybe I'll just take advantage of all this. Well, that's uh, a, that's a, theoretical that's a, you're, safety. A, you're now a walking advertising billboard for anyone who is looking to invite double jabbed people to the Grand Prix. Hello! And also Maybe me. we could be live from and the Paddock me. Club. That'd be cool. Oh, that'd be cool, yeah. Um, so, yes. Uh, Champagne sipping. Champagne. No, that would be a disastrous <laughs> podcast. <gasps> La TV! <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Latifa! Lawrence Stroll walks yeah. past. Give me money, Lawrence. <laughs> Sponsor this podcast. <laughs> so that would be a disaster. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a slightly dull race and a, therefore a slightly tough podcast to, to, to hey, put together. But we, we got happen. there. These things happen. It's the, we, it's, we've, well, we've, we've, we've learned from this experience on what we need to do if we have another boring race, either what we need to talk about the fact that we've got tennis and football on at the moment, maybe we could shift sport. If no, we it's an like one podcast. I'm like, <laughs> did you see the Belgium game? Wow. <laughs> it's not my vibe. Just a little section. You wish. Just a little section. You wish. I mean, we've literally got if the you same want, no, track no, no, no. If next you, week. Yeah, we could literally so re-upload this podcast next Monday. We should go. We, I know if we could. I said we could fly to Austria and just like, dig up curves to make it like kind of crazy. I don't know what, <laughs> but it needs to rain. Or we'll just take rain. a hose with us and put our little finger over the hose and just create sprinklers on the corners. Because you remember last year, the, the first race, the Austrian Grand Prix yeah. that was wet, the noise came, that was such an exciting, we were like, mm. wow, it's going to be so good. And that was the first race of the year, wasn't it? And we were like, this is amazing. And then it had the second race and it was, it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, fingers crossed some rain or something will happen next weekend need, or this yeah. weekend. So we, uh, need to, we need something to happen. Um, otherwise we might skip the next week's episode because <laughs> I'm not doing this again uh, but anyway I hope you guys have found it uh, enjoyable at least or in- I have. insightful no I, oh. I always do it's just a chance to nerd about F1 isn't it but <laughs> we've really somehow managed to get 45 minutes out of that's not, not a lot yeah that's, that's pretty good uh, uh, I promise future episodes will be more entertaining when the races are more entertaining uh, but if you want to hear us talk about F1 more make sure to subscribe now and turn on notifications uh, of course alongside the after the checker flag episodes also the regular behind the glass podcast which does I'm continue, banned from. which you are banned from you can't come on because you and Tony just go you have all these weird in jokes that I can't just make, it just it just makes you flap yeah it's your heart rate goes through the roof because Tony will come up with some random opinion I'll just back him up I know just I can't deal with it it's which is why Tony doesn't come on this one either. <laughs> Tony is me and, such, me and Tony aren't allowed in the same room with Sam. I can't listen to Tony talk about F1 because it comes out of such a place of ignorance. <laughs> but as with all things with Tony, self belief. Tony that it has infuriated. He, he has me. got himself into a little bit of a pickle in the sense that he has had a bet with a group of friends in a WhatsApp group, and half have gone for Max Verstappen to win the world championship, and half have gone for Lewis Hamilton. Obviously, Tony is in the Lewis camp. Right now, where would you put yourself? See, this is what I was saying earlier. I really, uh, on current form, right now, at this point of the season, I think Verstappen can win the championship. Mm. But it's a long old season to go. And how many times have we seen teams and drivers come back from the summer break and overturn big points advantages and I'm not just talking about in recent years I'm talking go all the way back to Vettel's and Alonso's Schumacher's and Hackner's you know it it does and it has happened that's why I never think you should write stroll off (laughs) (laughs) that's why we're going to end this week's episode thanks for tuning in we'll catch up with you soon bye bye